to Purposeful Empathy, a show dedicated to spreading more empathy throughout the world. Today's episode is brought to you by Grant Huron International, an on-demand coaching provider for individuals and companies. Thanks for watching, and I hope you enjoy the show. Hi, and welcome to a new episode of Purposeful Empathy. Today, I'm joined by Nilan Gore, who is a molecular biologist, activist, global citizen, and founder of Cultivate Empathy for All, which is a volunteer group of empathy enthusiasts. I absolutely love that. Welcome, Nilan. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for having me, Amiza. Now, I know that you believe our ecosystem is built on the principle of interdependence and exponential growth, and the philosophy underpinning your initiative, Cultivate Empathy for All, reads, and I'm quoting from the website, humankind's biggest challenge isn't climate change, large-scale conflicts or wars, inequality or poverty. It is the origin of these challenges that poses the most threats to our future. So with that as the backdrop, what does empathy mean to you and how is it related to systems thinking? Can you unpack all of that for us? Yeah, um, I think generally how we define empathy is our ability to put ourselves in someone's shoes, right? But I think that definition of empathy limits our ability to empathize with uh, others only limited to human beings, right? But our empathy capacity is to even cross the species barriers as well. So how I would like to define the empathy is our ability to put ourselves in someone's place and that someone can be human or non-human animals. And by putting ourselves in someone's place, we are now actually trying to look the world from the lens of that other person. And the world actually encompasses all the three aspects of our reality, which is physical state, emotional state, as well as the mental state. And by doing that, we are now having a firsthand experience of what the other um, being is going through. And that's how I would like to define the empathy. Now the question is, what is the importance of empathy and why we need to cultivate empathy? Um, it totally depends on how we are looking at the world around us. So there's two main ways how we actually look at the world and society around us. The first one, I call it a linear thinking. The linear thinking, the best way I can define it is just by giving an example. So for an example, I'm a man and I think that I'm a superior to women. Women are actually superior to LGBTQ communities. LGBTQ communities are superior to the wildlife. The wildlife is superior to the animals that are grown for food and fashion. And those animals do not have any existence, do not have a priority in our society. They are distanced, they are separate, and my well-being don't really depend on them. And this is a chain of superiority that we actually follow. And in this chain of superiority, there's only a one relationship that each entity has with the other group, and that's the tendency to abuse the groups that they think, quote unquote, has a less priority. So in this linear thinking, there is no space for empathy. And most importantly, what happens is that in this linear thinking, we actually, um, we, this, this linear thinking actually is the origin of majority of the social issues that we confront right now. For an example, the speciesism, racism, sexism, gender bias, so it's the origin of all the social issues that we are confronting right now, and it has no space for actually uh, empathy. The other school of thinking, which is backed by the science, is called a systems thinking. And systems thinking tells us that we are living in a highly interconnected ecosystem in which each one of our lives are actually interdependent on the fellow human beings, animals, environment, and vegetation. 
And so whenever we actually abuse them, we risk our own well-being, we risk our own lives. And, and that's why the only way to actually live in this interconnected ecosystem is by cultivating empathy for one another, independent of race, religion, sex, gender, or species. And that's why I feel that the empathy directly depends on the system's thinking. And in order to cultivate the culture of empathy, we have to first of all establish the system's thinking. They are two sides of a one coin. One can't live without the other. And that's the relation I see between the system's thinking and the empathy. I'm so struck by what you're saying. Um, and I'm curious to know if this is coming from sort of your, the tradition of, of biology that you studied, um, or, cause I also sense like when you're talking about systems thinking, it's like a transcendence of higher consciousness almost that we have to kind of understand that we're part of this oneness and, and, and that there is this independence. So is it science or is it spirituality? Like what, where, where, where's the origin of this thinking? Yeah, and, and um, how we actually in the field of science or uh, in the field of academia, how we would like to see is science, it's a separate field. Psychology, that's a separate field. Physics, completely separate, right? So we try to create, again, these boxes of fields and areas, and we consider them as completely separate. And we even have a separate box for spiritualism as well. Right. But where I actually see the world is everything is overlapping because there is a one truth. And if science is real, right, if spiritualism is real, if the psychology is real, then we are talking about the same thing from a different angle. And so for me, no matter what is the tone, the vocabulary that I actually use, the reality remains the same that we are all interconnected and the idea of individualism is the biggest illusion that is created by our capitalistic system that we need to overcome in order to create a systemic harmony on the planet Earth. Well, it really speaks to me. Thank you for sharing that. So what is, the, what is cross species and environmental empathy and why do, are these two concepts so important in the 21st century? Yeah, and um, thanks for asking uh, me that question, Anita. Uh, in the 21st century, as many of us know that environmental crisis is actually an existential threat. But still, many of us don't really understand the sense of urgency in addressing the environmental crisis. Again, we look at the environment from our um, idea of linear thinking. We consider that the issues that actually are related to human beings, they're separate from the environment and that's why they are more important. So we believe that economy is really important. We believe social justice has high priority and environment probably comes after that. Even the Democrats who actually believe strongly in environment, um, uh, addressing environmental crisis, for them even the priority for the addressing environment is much after addressing our broken economy and things like that. But in the reality, all the man created systems, whether it's a political system, whether it's an economy or our society, all these systems actually exist on top of the environment. So when environment gets destroyed, our economy, our society, our political system, all are destroyed. So that's why I feel that, um, that, that environmental crises should actually have equal priority when it comes to addressing our issues and spatially prioritizing as the existential threat. And, and one way to actually understand this uh, sense of uh, urgency is by empathizing with the people who are victims of environmental disasters the people who lost homes in California due to wildfires. In 2014, 36,000 farmers committed suicide. And one of the factors is environmental crisis. 
So when we tend to empathize with these people, we have now the sense of urgency in order to address the climate crisis. And we don't put the climate crisis after the economy, after the social justice, but we give it equal priority. And that's what I call it the environmental empathy. For cross species empathy, um, when we talk about uh, animals, I think we tend to put animals uh, in the last category, even after the environment. Uh, when I actually like speak to the council agenda committee or in the political environment, when I talk to the legislators, when we talk to them about the animal rights, it's the least priority. They don't even want to address it because they feel that there are so many urgent issues that they are trying to actually prioritize. What we are again lacking is that we are looking at this system through the linear thinking. And, 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 what, we are, and, and what we are failing to see is that, for an example, how in our food system, we have actually abused animals without understanding its consequence for on, on the public health as well as on the environment. And now we are actually jeopardizing our own uh, well-being. And pandemic is, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic is one of the examples, right? So we're failing to again have this systems thinking perspective. And because of that, we are jeopardizing our own well-being. So, so what we really need to do is to have an empathy that actually crosses the boundaries of species. And we need to start empathizing with the animals and their abuse and their cruelty and try and address it by prioritizing it. And, and, and especially when we talk about the environment, we fail to recognize that animal agriculture is contributing 4.5% of total anthropogenic greenhouse gas emissions. And science is telling us that by shifting our food systems towards plant-based diet, we can sequester even more carbon dioxide from atmosphere. So in total, by shifting our food system alone, we can reduce 28% of all anthropogenic uh, greenhouse gas emissions. This is the biggest solution for addressing the climate crisis and still it has no priority because we lack the very empathy to the animals who are not actually human animals. And, and, and that's what I actually call it, the cross species empathy. So you have you been a lifelong, so I know you're a vegan, have you been a lifelong vegan? No, I haven't been. Um, so could I you tell I'm, us, sorry. Yeah, no, go ahead. I was just gonna ask if you could tell us a little bit of the backstory and sort of some of the milestone choices or pivots that you made personally. Yeah, um, for me, um, I actually grew up back in uh, Gujarat state of India, and I grew up in a vegetarian family. So meat was never actually a part of my lifestyle. Um, definitely dairy was. Dairy was a very heavy part of our diet when I was growing up. And then when I was in a college back in India, like the idea was if you eat meat, like you are more masculine, you are more strong. So I try to then start eating chicken and, and try and like feel that I'm stronger than my other friends who are just vegetarians. And then I actually came over here for my master's degree and started learning more about the animal cruelty and abuse and everything. And so then slowly and steadily in the next few years, I started even shifting my diet more towards vegetarianism and then even trying to get rid of the dairy as well. And then, and then I shifted my diet, but I still felt that it's an individual choice. And so I don't really need to influence others. But in the last few years, I have learned that how much it impacts our society. It amplifies the systemic racism, which is a whole new topic. Really and how? then how, how, I'm sorry. How does it how does it have an impact on systemic racism? Yes, so um, if you actually so the systemic racism in the ag animal agriculture actually pervades in every step, 
And if we actually like start from the, the uh, meatpacking uh, plants, like meatpacking packing plants are actually, uh, they resemble to the modern day slavery in the sense that 44% of the slaughterhouse workers, they are Hispanic, 25% are black and 38% actually are coming from outside the country. So, so, so the slaughterhouse, the nature of the work, if I define first of all, it is so dangerous. Um, US Department of Labor actually um, says that uh, slaughterhouse is the most dangerous occupation in United States. And uh, if you actually look at the, um, the, the amputations, it averages two amputations per week. And so these are the most dangerous jobs in our country. And in order to do them, what we are doing is we are literally importing people from other countries to do our most dangerous job. So I say that it directly resembles the modern day slavery. And I'm even not talking about the prison labor, the cheapest prison labor that goes into it, paying them 35 cents. And if you actually hear about the accidents that goes into it, um, it it's, it's even really hard to talk about it or read about it. It's so violent. Um, so that's just the slaughterhouse. And, and, and especially I'm not even addressing what slaughterhouse um, have actually gone into during the COVID-19 pandemic. I think you are very aware of that. The, the uh, now even CDC is saying that earlier 8% of the COVID-19 cases were actually originated in the slaughterhouses. And these are the people who don't even have the healthcare system. So if they actually get into um, close contact or if they are infected with the COVID-19, they are going to lose their pay. And if they are immigrants, they might actually be deported back. And, and most important thing about the slaughterhouses is that because they lack um, so many protections that other employees in other occupations enjoy, they tend not to have that. And, and, and they are so-called at will of the employers. So many times they are always at the risk of deportation. So employers enforce the tremendous line speed on them. And what line speed means in the slaughterhouse environment is how many animals you are killing in an hour. And that actually goes up to over a thousand animals just in a one hour. So if even I look at this individual's mindset who are all day long doing nothing but killing animals, what are the emotional burden what are the emotional stress on these individuals? Now, even the science actually, and then and the, there are several reports that actually says that this work, that this, this kind of work, whenever slaughterhouses are actually established in the communities, the crime rate goes higher. So now we even understand that the violence that they confront within the walls of the slaughterhouse doesn't even stay over there. It actually flourish, it, it actually spreads as a wildfire throughout the entire community. And then we use, and then once they are actually in the law, um, in the criminal justice system, we know how the prison labor is being used again in the slaughterhouses. So it's the cycle of a violence. And this is just the slaughterhouses. I can, um, we can learn more about the um, animal factory farms and how it impacts the neighboring uh, communities. And those communities are, 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 are black and brown communities. And we don't really understand the, the impact of our daily choices that we actually make on those communities. And then we can go further towards the, the chronic illnesses that right now um, mainly and, and, and uh, disproportionately impacting um, underserved communities. And, and then we can actually look into even broader perspective from the standpoint of the global hunger. Uh, the, the amount of a food waste that actually goes into consumption of animal products, it's beyond uh, my imagination. What I used to think um, uh, food waste 
as a traditional food waste where between the retailers and consumers, the, the remaining food actually is being tossed out. But the idea is that just in order to produce five grams of a beef protein, we need to first of all supply 100 grams of a plant-based protein. And so in the whole process, 95% of the protein is being wasted. And so if we really wanna feed the 9 billion people, if we really wanna overcome the issue of a food security around the world as we move towards 2050, we have to shift our food system in a way where we can sustainably handle the 9 billion people living on the planet Earth. Wow, now that's that's a powerful argument that I've just been listening to. I am a little bit stunned by everything that I'm trying to absorb and, um, you know, because uh, I still sometimes eat meat, right? I'm trying to turn to a vegetarian diet. Um, I haven't really gone so far as to consider a vegan diet, but uh, that was that's a lot to integrate. Um, so I just want to breathe through that for a second. But what you're talking about, I mean, let's move off of meat and um, even, you know, the, the capitalist model that you've described, which is in, not in harmony with sort of ecology and, and nurturing our existence and, and knowing that we're all interdependent. You're talking about massive paradigm shifts. So you as an individual have created this um, organization or initiative called Cultivate Empathy for All. It's your effort to, you know, moving the needle on these systems changes that we need. Um, tell me what your current projects are and how people can get involved and where you would like to have an impact uh, more broadly with the work. Yeah. Um, so um, in the Cultivate Empathy for All, um, we understand that a uh, lack of empathy is the origin of all of our social and environmental issues. So it's really important for us to fix that. We need to cultivate the culture of empathy so that this social and environmental issues are stopped arising in our uh, world. And so that's really important, but we have to establish the culture of empathy while we are trying to address this, this major existential threat that we are facing as a humankind, right? So that's why in Cultivate Empathy for All, we are trying to address those major existential threats while establishing the cultivate, uh, while establishing the culture of empathy. So our approach actually runs parallel in order to achieve both these goals. And um, the way we do it is um, we, um, we are actually a group of volunteers and each volunteer in their community, they actually um, set the priority for the social or environmental issues that's very close to their heart and try to address that in the community in, from, the, from the sense, from the lens of empathy so that it's not only about fixing uh, the community or addressing the issue, but at the same time, cultivating the culture of uh, empathy in that community as well. And um, one of the biggest projects that right now uh, I'm working on in the city of Berkeley uh, is called uh, Vision 2025. And um, in the Vision 2025, we are actually asking our um, city councils to pass this vision um, by directing communities food system towards plant-based. And we asked them to actually look at the World Resource Institute or Oxford's most comprehensive meta-analysis and studies like that, that actually recommends that we need to shift 50% of animal-based or animal-derived product towards plant-based system. It's not only about going vegan, it's about bringing significant change in order to conserve our environment. And that's what we are asking for. And um, the good thing is in the city of Berkeley, our item is already introduced by a council member. And now we are in a conversation with the LA Council and many other cities. Uh, so that's where we are. So is your theory of change that um, if people worked at the community level on projects that are very close to their heart, 
and a significant number, a critical mass of communities do the same, that it'll tip the needle and the, the system will start to shift? Is that the idea? Yeah, and that's the basic idea, right? That um, every community, we call it empathy educators, this volunteers, those are the, those are the driving factors um, for cultivating empathy in the communities. But yes, the idea is that if every community, if every city has this group of empathy educators who are actually working in the different areas, different branches within their communities from the lens of empathy, we will be able to actually not overcome the issues that we are facing, but we will be able to cultivate empathy or culture of empathy in these communities. And it's like a ripple effect. So it could spread much more widely. And we are certainly not limiting our efforts within the city as well. So for an example, like um, even though my efforts are focused in uh, passing the vision 2025 in Berkeley, I'm also in touch with LA Council. I'm also in touch with El Cerrito cities. So it's not focused or limited only for the communities, but it's definitely, uh, I would say that starts from the community. Now you believe empathy increases the emotional energy in our hearts and that energy can be used to bring social, environmental and political change in our communities and beyond. So what are some of the ways in which you try to flex your empathy muscles sort of like on a daily practice or you know, something that you do habitually um, that might motivate some of our, our listeners and, and viewers? Yeah, um, for me, um, I feel that, um, um, just like anybody else, I actually grew up in a capitalistic society, right? And anyone who's grew up in a capitalistic society, our idea is our, 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 our whole, whole day actually roams around three things. I, me, and mine. What's important to me, what I want to achieve, how much I can achieve, how can I sustain what I have achieved? So I, me, mine is my world. And so for me to actually flex my empathy muscle, I have to first of all, try and, and erase those misinformation that's actually fed to me. And in order to erase those information, I need to first of all, um, practice um, and, um, meditation. And meditation allows me to actually remove those constant uh, floating ideas in my mind. It kind of creates a blank state where then I can actually write a new information, where then I can actually implement a new practice of seeing my whole world from the, the, from, from the position of someone else uh, as I actually move through the day. So for me, it's like, it's a blank state and I need to actually now start writing new information on it. But in order to get that, I need to actually like, first of all, try and erase or calm down the constant floating ideas in my mind. So, and so meditation for me is a really strong tool to flex my empathy muscle. Now I have a final question. This has been such a really, um, very, very, um, compelling conversation. I've really enjoyed chatting with you. Thank you so much for all the time you've given. Um, you know, we, we had a rough year 2020 um, with the, uh, you know, systemic racism has been around for a long time, but it was exposed like never before. And then COVID overlaid on top of that. And we've started off 2021, at least in the United States with a um, some really scary uh, visuals of, of the siege on the Capitol. Um, that's just in the short history, but I just wonder if you project into the future, are you hopeful? Do you feel that humanity is gonna, is gonna get the empathy right? Um, I, like, I feel that um, there's no guarantee for the future, right? Uh, what's in the future is the hope. And the hope starts with us fixing what's wrong. And now we know what's wrong. It's just not understanding what is the scientific nature, what's the reality of the world that we live in. 
and how close and interdependent we are and how we have constantly been fed this idea of individualism, individual success, individual gain in the capitalistic society. So for us, it's a hope that we can cultivate the empathy, overcome this misinformation that's fed to us throughout by the capitalistic society and move towards the future that is more um, established in a systemic harmony. And so what I see is not the guarantee that we will overcome, what I see is the hope. And when I focus on a hope, I think my optimism grows. What a beautiful way to end our conversation, Nilang. Thank you so, so much. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. We'll see you at the next episode of Purposeful Empathy. What if you had access to your own council of coaches to help you break free of your thinking clutter, make that important decision, and liberate you from what's holding you back? At Grand Huron International, you get to choose the coach of your choice. You get to do so anytime and from anywhere. Visit GrandHuronInternational.com and harness the power of on-demand coaching today.